Good morning, Chandralika. It's so nice to have you here. Um, actually, Thank you for having me. Good. Yes, actually, on the other side, you were the interviewer, and today you're the interviewee. Right. Um, would you maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself, your name, where you're from, and maybe a bit about your positions and your research at that? Okay. So my name is Chandralika Singh. I grew up in India and uh, I went to the Indian Institute of Technology there and then I went to University of California Santa Barbara and I did condensed matter theory. I was studying uh, nonlinear optical properties of polymers and then I went to University of Illinois and there also I did condensed matter theory and after that I came to University of Pittsburgh and now I'm a professor here in the physics department and I'm also the director of the Discipline-Based Science Education Research Center. So that's a little less physics, more education. Um, would you tell us? Well, I won't say it's less physics, well, more education. I would say, say it's as, as much physics <laughs> as it is education. You yeah. know, so I would say that, you know, basically I still do physics, but my focus is on physics education research. So I do research in how to improve the teaching and learning of physics. And uh, this transition happened about 20 years ago. So after coming to Pitt, I got really interested in education issues because I started teaching and I realized that my students were not learning as much as I was hoping they would. And then there were a lot of different centers here, like learning research and development center at, center at Pitt. There was a center for innovation and learning at Carnegie Mellon. And so I got to meet a lot of people and I took several classes in education and then my research area changed to physics education research. And that's because, you know, I'm really passionate about improving student learning. And once I started doing research in this area and I started seeing that those things were working, mm -hmm. I kept doing more and more of it. And now I do research in physics education full time. Yeah. Actually, not only do I do research in <laughs> physics education full time, this uh, center that I'm directing actually promotes and supports evidence-based approaches to teaching and learning in nine science departments oh. here at the Dietrich School of Science and uh, Arts and Sciences at Pitt. You really look passionate about that. It shows um, the way you speak about what you do. Maybe you could tell us also about what inspired you to get to there, not only um, first as a physicist, condensed matter physicist, and then as you said, as you, trend, as you made the transition to physics education research. Sure. I mean, I think I don't exactly know whether there was one thing that mm -hmm. actually motivated me to study physics, but I think I was always very good in math and I always was very curious to know about how things worked. And so physics seemed like that kind of a discipline where, that, where I could actually find answers to those things. So that definitely helped. I also had very good high school physics teacher. So that definitely helped too. Um, and then I actually had an older brother who was in physics. Now, it's interesting because my brother and I never really talked about physics. And it could partly be because my brother was actually always in a boarding school, mm -hmm. in middle school, high school, and, you know, beyond that. Yeah. So we only met in holidays and we were mainly just playing and doing, you know, fun stuff. But still, it could have had some indirect yeah. influence on getting into physics. But yeah, I mean, I have always been very passionate about improving student learning and uh, so that's why I love my area of research, physics education research. And truthfully, I feel like, you know, the kind of job that I have is the best job in the world because, you know, this is something that I really enjoy doing. I could do this 24 hours a day <laughs> or more and not get tired of doing it. Well, I, I just, I just a little speaking of all this time that you spend doing physics, you also have a family, you have two grown sons. How did you balance life and work and uh, all the hats that you juggle as a physicist, educator, director of DB Circ? Yeah, you know, I don't think that I ever really tried to balance anything. I didn't think of it as, you know, balancing two things. Mm -hmm. I just didn't try to balance anything. So. Um, when my kids were young, they always came back from school to my office. And if you see my office, I have a desk for myself and then there are two desks on two sides and they are for my children, you know, because one of them will sit on one side and the other one on the other side. 
And in fact, they love my office so much, they actually enjoyed coming to my office and playing there and running around in those big corridors. You know, yeah. those corridors are so beautiful that you can really run from here to there. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can just sit and read, whatever. They loved my office and the corridor in front of my office <laughs> so much that if on a weekend I told them, we are not going to go to my department today on a Saturday because I have work at home or I don't want to go, they would get upset. They're like, Mom, how can you not go? Really? You've got to go. You know, Let's go because it's so much fun in your office. And I remember my son Akash had to write an essay about his favorite place in the world. And what happened, what, what do you think was his favorite place? Your office. Yes, his mother's <laughs> office was his favorite place because he got to do all sorts of things. I mean, it may even be that I was slightly distracted with my work, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe he was also doing things that maybe at home <laughs> I would actually say, oh, Akash, maybe you shouldn't be doing this or something. <laughs> but they definitely had a good time. So I don't think I necessarily ever thought about you know, taking care of the kids and taking care of my work and basically those things just went hand in hand. And I would say that one of the great things about being a university professor is that I think you can balance work and family pretty well. You know, like, so mm -hmm. I would say I work very hard, you know, I work seven days a week, but at the same time, there is flexibility in terms of time. So yes. if, uh, apart from the time that you teach, right? you can basically do things at your own time. So if mm -hmm. you don't want to do it during the day, you want to do it in the evening, you can do it. So it's not that you have very stringent times when you must get something done. It's important you get things done, but you can do it in the night or in the morning or mm -hmm. you know, at any time that is convenient for you. So I think that it, in a way, this profession is very good for balancing yeah. family and work. Okay. Um, about your journey, maybe, if you want to reflect on it and say something about what you wish you'd known at the time when you started, and at the same time what you would maybe like to tell other young women who, who wants to be physicists. Well, so to young women who want to be physicists, I would say go for it. I mean, it's really fun. I mean, each day is really exciting and you look forward to doing things and every night when I go home I'm always saying oh my god I can't believe my day is over you know so I'm looking forward to coming back the next day to do more work so this is a kind of job in which you really enjoy what you do mm -hmm. and you're getting paid to do what you do <laughs> what you always wanted to do even for free so I think that um, it's really a dream job, at least I, I think for me. And I feel like if you enjoy physics, you would actually never look back. You would really have fun yeah. doing you know, what I do, for example. I'm sure, however, there has been some, there have been some challenges, maybe especially as you're a woman, have you encountered any kind of gender bias along the way or hardships? Well, okay, so, so there are two different kinds of things here, you know, like, so, but both of them relate to me being a woman, you know, one is just general hardships. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know that my husband is also in physics, Jeremy Levy, and so when we came to University of Pittsburgh, initially I came here as a postdoc, actually, because uh, they did not have a tenure track position at the time over here, and I had ten, three tenure track offers from other universities, but I still came here as a postdoc and I had to take a pay cut actually. So I was getting poor, paid more as a postdoc at Urbana than I did over here. But I still came here as opposed to, you know, taking the jobs elsewhere, which were tenure track jobs mm -hmm. that were paying more than twice the amount that I was getting paid here because I wanted to start a family and I had already been separated with my husband for two years so I figured this would be the better choice for me so I had to make the hard decision um, and then three years later my position actually got changed to a lecturer's position which was better in the sense that it was a longer term position but uh, it still was something that actually paid me even less than a postdoc 
So I got another pay cut actually. Instead of increasing after three years, my pay actually went down further from the initial pay that I had gotten three years ago here, which was already lower than the Urbana one. So you can see that I had to make all of these decisions about whether I wanted to actually do these things. But if I were hung up on my salary, then I would never have actually taken the job because, you know, $22,000, you know, for a lecturer sounds like not a lot of money, but that's what I was being paid, you know, in 1998 mm -hmm. as a lecturer. You know, that was the salary. And so you can see that was difficult, but I decided that that was the right thing for me. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you make hard decisions and you stick with it because you really feel that the kind of job that you would be doing is the right kind of job for you, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that I got my tenure track position in 2005 when I actually got an offer from another university Arizona State University and then this university matched it. Mm -hmm. So that time, you know, my position actually became the kind of position that I'd always wanted. Now, in terms of gender bias, yes, I, I have experienced gender bias a lot. And one of the things about gender bias in science is that you actually experience it more the higher up you go. So, you know, like even <coughs> if you don't feel it as a student, mm -hmm you will feel it as a faculty or maybe even when you become some administrator, yeah. you know, like maybe even more. So let me give you some examples. So one time I went to the Pittsburgh um, Regional Science Fair and I was a judge for that. I volunteered to be the judge for physics section, maybe high school physics section or something like that. And then we got together to discuss it with other people and there were maybe like 10 other men there and I was the only woman and all of those people were from industries. My voice as you can see is very loud, it projects very well. So it's, there is no way that people in the room would not hear mm -hmm. me. But these people, every time I tried to give my opinion about what I thought about those students, you know, like who had presented different things and what their ranking should be or anything like that they 100% ignored me. They just pretended I was not there, you know. So whatever I would say, they would just like, just start talking about, uh, amongst themselves and pretend that I, would, I just didn't exist there. So you can see that if, this is definitely an example of gender bias. Now, but even in academia, you know, gender bias is quite common. Uh, so for example, one of my colleagues here told me when I was in a non-tenure track position, mm -hmm. remember I told you that I was in a non-tenure track position for a while? He said, why do you care to get a tenure track position? You know, your husband has a tenure track position. You know, you guys make enough together to, you know, live decently. Why do you care? The thing is, would he have said the same thing to my husband? I doubt it. Yeah, he wouldn't have said this because, you know, like he's saying it because I'm a woman. You know, like if my husband was the trailing spouse, who was on a non-tenure track position, he would never have said this to, yeah. to him. So he's saying it. And the interesting thing is that this colleague is somebody who actually said to a local newspaper that physicists are not biased in terms of you know making any oh. discrimination <laughs> against women. And you know other things that are very common are things like you know people not paying attention to the kinds of things that you say mm -hmm. at a faculty meeting. For example, I am an expert in undergraduate and graduate education. In fact, I have been an organizer for all of the physics, graduate education in physics conferences that have happened. In fact, I was the chair of the second mm -hmm. conference in graduate education in physics um, organized by the American Physical Society. But you know, even then in my department, if there is some discussion about graduate or undergraduate education, and if I give some suggestions to them, instead of thinking of me as an expert, you know, my colleagues would just like keep talking about their own agenda, you know, like as though, and then they'll be like, no, no, I like his agenda more. And, and then they'll go on with whatever they are thinking, as opposed to the fact that whatever I am saying has actually been thought about and mm -hmm. has been discussed at conferences. So it's not like something that you should just ignore because I really do know a lot more about this issue. So, but this is a very common thing. So how, 
what kind of advice would you give a young woman, for example, when she comes into that kind of situation? How do you fight it? Well, you know, I don't think that these kinds of things should actually deter people mm -hmm. from being in physics. I think that we need to make opportunities better for other women. Now, I will say that this year I'm actually one of the team leaders, one of the two team leaders of the U.S. physics team for the International Conference on Women in Physics that is happening in Birmingham in UK. And uh, as part of this U.S. team's mission, we are also going to develop a website that we are actually in the process of developing right mm -hmm. now, which focuses on gender bias issues, you know. So this site will have things like what kinds of experiences women have had, mm -hmm. implicit or explicit, because it would depend upon the country, you know, like the kinds of things that I am saying to you, they are examples of implicit bias, implicit gender bias, but there are several countries where bias against women physicists is still explicit. Mm -hmm. So we want to invite female physicists from all over the world. You know, there will be about 250 or so at this wow. conference. Yeah, from all over the for, from about 50 countries. Yeah. Because I was there at the last international conference on women in physics that happened in Waterloo, Canada, and there were about that many of them. But the point is that at this conference, um, we will ask people to basically participate in this forum mm -hmm. and share their experiences and then we are going to actually also have discussions about what can be done to actually mitigate these situations and also what would be a good response in these situations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is gender bias is actually inherent in our society. It's so, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And what is interesting is that women themselves are biased against other women. You know, that's another thing that research is showing. So it's not just that women, men have bias yeah. against, men have bias against women, but women themselves have the same kind of bias against other women too. So my suggestion would be to really lean in and lean in is a book that was written by Sheryl Sandberg. You know, she's the, She's at Facebook, right? She used to be at Google before this. And Lean In basically says that, you know, women need to lean in for other women. So they shouldn't be hard on other women just like everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that definitely would be something that people should think about carefully. But I think that otherwise the ride has been great and I really have enjoyed every moment of being in physics. Just that I think that these kinds of uh, gender bias issues are things that we are still working on and yeah. it will take time to fix them completely. But you are hopeful. Oh, of course, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Great. Would you maybe like to conclude this interview with one of your favorite quotes, something that in inspires you? Um, my favorite quote is, every cloud has a silver lining. Yes, <laughs> that's perfect. Then. Yeah, because I'm an optimist. <laughs> I always look at things in a positive way. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that oh, with yeah. us, and it was really Thanks a pleasure. So much. Thank you, Chandra Thanks a lot.